Thank you so much, Dr. Deepa and Dr. Alex, for being a part of the first Healthy Bite Summit, Low Carb for Beginners. So I'm thrilled that you've agreed to be our experts and answer a few questions that, you know, I, we know that people who are interested in low carb might want to try, but there may be a few questions that they just, you know, are unsure of. So um, I'd love to ask you a few questions today around sort of putting many of those fears at bay. So thank you again and yeah, welcome. Thanks for having us, Trace. Great to be part of the Healthy Bite Summit. My pleasure. Awesome, awesome. Well, the first question I have for you is, what is a low carbohydrate diet? A low carbohydrate diet is a very much an umbrella term. So it covers a, a raft of different types of diets within it. But the thing that underlies it is that it is a whole food, real food uh, dietary approach uh, that's based on millions of years of evolution. And typically at our clinic, we would define a low carb diet as starting from anything that's under 100 grams of carbohydrates. And that between 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrates per day would be defined as something that's liberal low carbohydrate. 20 to 50 grams of carb per day would be defined as more a moderately low carb diet. And then a very low carb diet is typically under 20 grams of carbohydrate per day. And many people would also define that as a ketogenic diet because for most people who are eating such low carbs, they would be producing ketones on those types of diets. So it is a, 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 a wide variety of diets that come under one umbrella. And it depends on for what purpose you're needing or wanting to use this dietary um, approach. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Well, I've got a question about that one uh, down the track. So the next question I have though is, is it safe for everybody? So a, a low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet is, is safe for almost everyone in the community. There are a few situations that are uh, thankfully rare, but there are a few situations where, where starting a low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet is not appropriate. So the most important group of patients who, who cannot do a low carb diet by virtue of the fact that it is by design a higher fat diet uh, are people that have inborn errors of metabolism. So these are um, a cluster of genetic conditions uh, where patients are unable to metabolize certain compounds or for instance fatty acids. So um, for instance, people with carnitine deficiency or people with um, inborn errors of fat metabolism, uh, they cannot do a higher fat diet or a lower carb diet safely. Now, most of these patients, they know who they are. They've been diagnosed as a, as a newborn or as a, as a young baby, or they, they had a family history of these conditions in the family. So usually they're uh, under the care of, of a metabolic specialist who would have advised them against eating a higher fat diet. So, but for the vast majority of those people, they know that they shouldn't be on a low carb diet. They've been told in the past. Other groups of people that uh, should not be starting a low carb diet would be people who are acutely unwell. So people who are hospitalized or acutely unwell um, need great caution if they're changing their diet in this way. So people with, for instance, acute liver failure or acute pancreatitis, um, these are a group of people that can get sicker if they make a sudden change to a low carb diet. And in this group, if it does need to be made, it should be done under very strict monitoring in a hospital environment, ideally. Um, the, the final group of people who you need to be cautious with is, is people with a history of eating disorders. So not so much from a biochemical point of view, but from a practical point of view. Um, we, we are concerned about any, any sort of restrictive or any, uh, any, any restrictive eating pattern or any change in a diet that's more regimented in someone who's got a history of uncontrolled eating disorder, so active anorexia or bulimia or, 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 or something along those lines. Now, that doesn't mean that people with a history of eating disorders cannot do low-carb diets. In fact, for, for many of them, it may actually give them more freedom from, from food anxiety, but it just means that um, you need to be mindful that, uh, that their eating disorder is controlled before they, before they undertake any change in their diet. Yeah. What about someone who's had their gallbladder, gallbladder removed? Can that cause an issue? Yeah, so that's a really common question we get. Um, and, and the short answer is they can definitely do a low carb diet. Um, the, the question for all of these patients is going to be how low carb and how high fat can you get away with? And we know that 
uh, patients have had their gallbladder out. Um, usually in the short term, they are more sensitive to high fat diets that can't um, absorb fat as well. But what happens over time is even without a gallbladder, their liver can adjust and produce more bile, which is what the gallbladder is supposed to hold. And, and that's the sort of natural detergent that your, your body makes to help break down fat. So usually if someone comes to us um, who's had their gallbladder out and they're already able to tolerate eating really fatty meat or eating really rich meals, they won't have a problem because they've already adjusted. But if they come to our clinic and say that they still get diarrhea when they eat a salmon fill or they still get diarrhea when they eat some, a moderate amount of fat, then for them we need to be a little bit careful. We tell them that over time, if you teach your body that you're eating more fat, then your liver will adjust, but it, it's more of adjustment then rather than a sudden change. So. For them, we would start off at that higher carbohydrate level, so more towards the, the 100 grams typically, and slowly work it down over time. But yeah, the long story short, someone without a gallbladder can absolutely do a low carb diet um, safely in the long term. Okay, so the next question is, what does the term insulin resistance mean and why is it so important to avoid it? Uh, yeah, so the term insulin resistance is, um, it's quite a, it is a complex topic area, but to really break it down into, I suppose, its fundamentals is that insulin is a hormone in the body and it's produced by a organ called the, or a gland actually called the pancreas. And the pancreatic gland, it produces a number of hormones, but um, it is insulin that's most fundamental to clearing the bloodstream of blood glucose or sugars and where these sugars come from typically are from the diet. So when you are consuming carbohydrates, they break down into glucose, which is the sugar that we see in the bloodstream. And uh, we need the hormone insulin to keep blood sugar at a really strict level of control within the bloodstream. We ideally want it to be between four to five and a half or maybe at the most six at any one time. Uh, if it does deviate above that or below that, uh, we do have these hormones that help to regulate and make sure that they're always uh, at, a, at a pretty good amount in the bloodstream, uh, neither too much, too little. So when it comes to insulin resistance, that's where we're going, getting quite a, um, a buildup of blood glucose in the bloodstream because the the cells downstream, and these are typically fat cells and muscle cells, they're starting to downregulate their insulin receptors. Um, and that happens for a variety of different reasons, but primarily, for instance, in a, in a setting of uh, someone who's dealing with overweight or obesity, these cells, particularly fat cells, have already filled up with the um, amount of energy that they can hold. So they're approaching capacity. So one theory is that these insulin receptors start to downregulate, which sit on these cells, and then the insulin has to be um, produced at more at higher and higher levels to even signal these insulin receptors to want to then take glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cells. So we get into this cycle where there's a higher and a higher production of insulin, and that's circulating in the bloodstream, but it, the blood glucose is signaled to go nowhere and it's, it's not really clearing the bloodstream in an effective manner. And so we're left with this uh, phenomenon of insulin resistance, which can be quite uh, terrible in, in and of its own right, because you've not only got the, the high levels of glucose that are causing these long-term problems we see with eyesight and kidney, heart disease, um, all of these complications of diabetes that we see, but also the high insulin level independently triggers a lot of people to feel like they're hungry all the time, lacking control over their appetite, um, and they're also experiencing inflammation at the arterial level uh, from the, the mere presence of high levels of insulin. So that can lead then on towards conditions like cardiovascular disease. So it, it's quite a um, profound effect that happens not over a few days, but these, this is often something that progresses over many decades. And we typically say to people who may have come in to see us and they've actually been diagnosed recently as a, as a type two diabetic, 
that they probably actually had insulin resistance for at least 10 years prior to that time. So that's uh, where this it's so important, I suppose, to understand what, what has been the root cause of the issue um, with metabolic syndrome, which um, we can talk about in, in a moment. Yeah, so well, the next question was, what does metabolic syndrome mean? Mm. So metabolic syndrome is a, is a term that's been around in a few different um, in a few different guises for many, many decades. So it was originally called syndrome X, and basically mm. there were five criteria. So one was increased waist circumference. So for a man that's over 102 centimetres, for a woman that's over 88 centimetres. The second criteria was elevated triglycerides in the blood. So that's a, a marker that you would have on your cholesterol test. The third one was low HDL cholesterol on your cholesterol test. The fourth one was high blood pressure. So typically above 130 um, or above 85 for the diastolic. And the fifth one was elevated fasting glucose. Mm. So that sort of either diabetic or pre-diabetic um, range of sugar. So typically over about um, six. Uh, millimoles per, per litre in Australian units. So this this syndrome uh, was identified as this constellation of, of, of factors that um, doctors would see in patients well before they could actually measure insulin. But what it's really describing is some of the basic physical characteristics and, and, and blood characteristics of people who are insulin resistant. So that, that's really what metabolic syndrome is. And when you look at what metabolic syndrome is linked with, it's linked to an increased risk of diabetes, of heart disease, of stroke, of Alzheimer's, uh, of cancer. And when we really drill down to it, all of these conditions, which are very much diseases of modernity or diseases of Western civilization, they are all underpinned by insulin resistance. So if anyone has three or more of these five factors, they, they can be diagnosed as metabolic syndrome. And at the end of the day, that's just um, saying you have insulin resistance that's relatively severe. Mm -hmm. Well, moving on then from understanding, I suppose, the risks of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, mm -hmm. um, if we look then on what we can do about it, which is obviously low carbohydrate diets helping, you know, manage and, you know, prevent, reverse, put into remission, whatever language people want to use around that, so then who would benefit? I mean, it's probably sort of common sense, really, when you follow on from what you've just said, but who would benefit most from reducing their carbohydrate intake? The, I think a lot of people would benefit in different ways from the yeah. reduction of um, carbohydrates in their diets. I suppose primarily one of the main reasons low-carb diets became so so a part of um, the medical sphere and in nutrition spheres as well, and now more so in mainstream uh, culture, is that the, there, was, uh, there was a use of these diets for quite some time and people saw as a side effect was weight loss. So I think people who are dealing with obesity, overweight and having a very difficult time trying to lose weight using a standard dietary approach have found great success when it comes to this way of eating simply because they're really reducing their reliance upon glucose and sugar as their main fuel and moving more towards their own glucose that they can produce themselves so that's actually training and pushing their liver to make uh, glucose through a process of gluconeogenesis and that's why you see around um, a lot of um, a lot of information on social media recently saying that carbohydrates are non-essential in the diet because we can actually make that glucose uh, as part of as part of a human evolution and the, the second part is if you lower that glucose low enough and, and, and lower your carbohydrates low enough, then you can become more fueled by fats. And that has lots of side benefits thereafter. So many people come for the weight loss, but they start to realise that there's a lot to benefit in terms of energy, concentration, cog massive cognitive improvements, specifically around mental health as well. Uh, but in it also to autoimmune conditions, which uh, the high levels of insulin seem to be 
one of those factors that can contribute to the inflammatory nature of those conditions. So when you tr when we are looking at conditions like rheumatoid arthritis uh, um, and gut disorders like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, there is great benefit to be derived from a lower insulin and a low, lower glucose because of the flow on effect to reduce inflammation. So this, uh, this sort of area now, I would describe many medical conditions can actually benefit or, or people with, with different varying conditions. And the level of, or I suppose the tailoring of a low carb diet to suit that individual is really important because not everybody necessarily needs to be ketogenic uh, and on the other uh, end of the spectrum, not everyone necessarily needs or thrives on the higher carbohydrate versions of, of a low carb diet, so closer to that 100 grams. Uh, but yeah, in terms of who benefits, it, it is a wide variety. And of course, diabetics, diabetics of any kind, so gestational diabetics, type 1 diabetics and type 2 diabetics, they would derive great benefits simply from that stricter control of glucose, but through a really sustainable dietary eating pattern, whereas most of the, the classical dietary eating patterns that were recommended were always about restriction and reduced volume overall of food, which or, and with, with no regard, regard to the way that carbs and protein and fat interact with their hormones. So they were always left feeling hungry and um, craving food in between each meal, which was not really a sustainable way to eat. Probably most people could last two to three months and then would give up at that stage. Um, mm, that. And, and <laughs> willpower, which is really sad when it has nothing to do with willpower at the end That's of the day. Right. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that because it is such a, it's a massive thing because we, you know, we were, most of us were sort of, you know, drilled to think we had to be hungry. It was such a punishment almost mm. to go on a diet. And, you know, when you fundamentally switch the way you do it and work with your body instead of against it, to actually lose weight without being hungry is just such a concept that so many people haven't, you know, and never experienced. And then when they do experience it, it's just, it is almost, I mean, it's life changing. It's not a an underestimate to say that. It is incredible, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, then moving on to our last question, love, you know, really nicely flows on from what you were just talking about. How do you know how low carb that you do need to go? So I think it really comes down to addressing a patient's goals and what they're trying to achieve. And then um, using that in combination with their history, with their relevant blood work, um, and how they're feeling as we progress. So we will often tell patients, you know, say, for instance, if it was a diabetic, you know, the, the worse your diabetes is, the stricter you may need to be when it comes to, to getting results. Um, so if you were just diagnosed, you may be able to get away with a more liberal approach compared to someone who's been a poorly managed diabetic for 10 years, who's, who's got, um, you know, really bad diabetes. Um, so, so we use the blood works uh, and their the history to, to help um, gauge that and then see how they're feeling. So, for instance, some people um, who come for a variety of different conditions, they don't feel so great when, they're, when their carbohydrates are really restricted, under 20 grams a day. So, yes, they may be uh, in nutritional ketosis, which means they're making lots of ketones in their blood for fuel, but they may not feel good. So if that's not the goal, then we may need to adjust it up. Um, so we always tell patients, you know, where, where we start is not necessarily set in stone. And so we always are constantly uh, adjusting based on what are the goals and how, how patients are feeling. Conversely, for some patients, it's not about weight loss or insulin resistance. Um, it's about actually having ketones. So for instance, if someone wants to come and manage their, their epilepsy or wants to use their treatment as an adjunct for you know, Parkinson's disease or cancer or a variety of things, then for them, they, they need the ketones in the blood. So for them, a moderate low-carb approach, even if they feel fine doing that, um, may not actually get them to, to what they're trying to achieve. So for them, we do need to tailor it to be a bit more strict. And we are luckier in our field that we've got um, technology that we can use, such as blood ketone monitoring or continuous glucose monitors that can help give us that feedback and to give patients that feedback that they're on the right track. Mm -hmm. 
It's fantastic because you've really shown the nuances of it all because one of the things I, you know, advocate is, you know, it really is an individualised approach and that's exactly what you've shown with that and that, you know, there are so many blanket ways, uh, you know, particularly if someone's following social media, you know, it looks like it's just a one-size-fits-all, you know, this is the number of carbs, this is what you've got to do. And, of course, you've seen and, you know, I see in my work that it just doesn't work that way and getting, you know, the help of someone like yourselves to really see, well, where are we starting from and where do we want to be and how are we going to get there? And that's going to look very different for for everybody. But I kind of say, you know, it would save so much time and, you know, feeling like you're lost if you, you know, really it's so worth getting that help um, at the start to help, you know, navigate the right path for you. So, um, you know, I think it's it's fantastic the information that you shared. Um, I guess I didn't have this on the list when we talked about the questions, but, mm. I, you know, I just love, you know, for you, anything that you might want to share from your own perspective, you know, obviously this summit is, um, you know, trying to get people curious to give it a go um, and to really understand that, you know, it's not some woo-woo thing and it's not a fad diet. It's certainly, you know, optimising um, our humanness and working with our body um, but what you know from each of your perspective what would be something that you would like to say to to people watching about potentially stepping in or anything to do with local I think the main thing I see at the moment is that we live in a fairly toxic food environment and it does make it difficult for people to make that first step and that first change simply because of what they're surrounded by and the normalisation of the type of foods that we have access to very readily in our supermarkets. The moment we step out our door, petrol stations, you know, filled with the, the type of food that they have. But I think the most important thing is to remain open-minded and to start questioning what is food? And, you know, food is fundamentally a fuel. And that's how it's been for millions of years through human evolution. So we need to fuel ourselves. And if the food you see is not recognisable, you, you can't understand where it came from, what's been put into it, and it has a, a raft of ingredients and numbers, particularly on the ingredient panels, we have to start questioning, is this really how we are wanting to fuel ourselves ongoing? How we want it to says low carb keto on the front. Absolutely. <laughs> that's a that's a, a fantastic point because the health food aisle now is unfortunately full of those types of products claiming all mm. sorts of health benefit, but they're just as bad as the other rubbish on the confectionery aisle. So it really means that there's the, the I think the most important thing is to not judge these products based on what what is said on the front and you know what claims they've made, but really turn it around, read those ingredient panels and question everything about is that real food? Can that be derived from something that has a a real source? Or is this actually created artificial food? And I and this is so important with where we're sitting at uh, at the moment with food companies trying every which way to hook people, make money out of people, uh, and at the cost of their health. And I think that's the fundamental disgrace that if we are to sit back and just have a look and we reassess that picture as a beginner to this space, Asking yourselves those questions is really important to to understand why you're doing something because that motivation will then keep you going. Brilliant. And I love the word hooked because that's really what they are trying to do. I think you you nailed it spot on. Thank you, Dr. Decker. That's great. Alex, did you? Following on from that, I think um, yeah. one insight after practising in this area for several years that really gained is if people treat this as a diet, especially as a crash diet, it's not. It's less likely to work long term. So it, when we first see people, we talk a lot about the science and the biochemistry so that they really understand that. But for many of them, especially people struggling with weight and diabetes, um, long term, how the battle is won is actually by fixing their relationship with food. So 
So one of the problems is, and this is one of the things that makes this hard, is um, you can, we can give someone this the perfect macro breakdown of carbs, protein, fat. We can give them all the supplements they need, but if they can't put it into practice at home, then it's it's not as useful for them. So in the medium to long term, addressing their relationship with food is really important for a lot of patients because a lot of patients come to us with a poor relationship with food. Um, either they've been brought up in a household that commiserates with sugar, that celebrates with sugar and treats every good behaviour with sugar, or they've, they've been brutalised by the diet system, um, yeah. Weight Watchers all the way through to, you know, all the fad diets of 2022. So, so part of how to, to make a, a ketogenic or a low-carb diet work long-term for people is to not think of it as a diet, actually. We use the word diet, but it's more of a way of eating and, um, you know, really emphasising that they can... Um, achieve that sort of control over what they eat so they're fueling their body with the right things and not and not using food as an emotional outlet or as a as a way to get a quick hit of dopamine i think that's really important that a lot of the the online discourse around the science of low carb somewhat ignores that um, totally. and again this is where working with a provider helps a lot because you can you know you can buy a book or um look online for all the sort of science around things but that may not help your individual circumstances and it may not help you understand what your weaknesses are or what your blind spots are when it comes to food and, and it may not help you actually repair them in the long term yeah oh brilliant i, I so agree um you know i think that is it's kind of like it doesn't really matter why you first step in but when you step in it's going to open up a world where you know you can look at so many different areas to heal you know exactly your relationship with food you know i think if we don't have awareness of that you know obviously if we don't have awareness we can't change it we can't fix it so that process but that's that can be very very confronting but at the end in the end of the day it's very liberating to address these things and you know, that drives pretty much everything i do because as you say, there's so many people talking about the science. It's just, you know, really all that they're, you know, because that's their comfort, I suppose, that's what they know. But at the end of the day, they're not with you at 10 o'clock at night when all you want to do is go for that bucket Great. of ice cream and you don't know you have an alternative or don't know how to manage all of that. And I think, you you know, brilliant, you know, what you've, what you've shared, what you do. Uh, I'm so grateful. I think you're both fantastic. As you know, I... I, I, sh I tell everyone <laughs> to come and see you. <laughs> Likewise, Chris. <laughs> Your work is incredibly important in this field as well with coaching and giving people those skills. The, this is what Alex talks about with the long term, to, to really make that a way of life. It's, that's the, where the most powerful impact um, comes from this way of eating. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so possible. You know, I think you may not have all the answers. In fact, you won't have all the answers when you first start, but it's 100% yes. possible to do it. Um, so, yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. All your details are below. Of course, as Sydney Low Carb Specialist, you are able to see anybody in Australia. Is that right? Via yep. telehealth? Yep. Yep. Um, yep. yep. So uh, anyone watching who wants to reach out to you, obviously your details are below um and yeah thank you so much for taking the time to to be a part of the summit really appreciate it no, no pleasure. it's our pleasure